Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. God is good, amen? All the time. Yeah, don't be shy to clap. It's not for us, it's for him. In a cozy home filled with the gentle hum of anticipation, a young boy eagerly awaited a momentous arrival. His parents, brimming with joy, and tenderness were thrilled to share some wonderful news with him. They told him how God was sending a little sister into his life, a precious gift for them to cherish and nurture. The boy's heart danced with excitement and curiosity. He had heard stories of God, the creator, the unseen and mighty one, but now this God was sending someone very special to their family. So the day finally came, finally arrived. The little sister arrived, a little bundle of innocence and wonder, safely cradled in her crib. The boy with the wide-eyed innocence that only a child can possess, he tiptoed over to her side. His heart was full of questions, questions that had fluttered in his mind like a butterfly. He leaned close to his little sister as she was laying in the crib, his voice, a gentle whisper. And he said, quick, little sister, tell me before you forget, what does God look like? What an extraordinary question that really is. See, for millennia, humans have grappled with this question. Humans have searched for God in the vast expanse of the universe. They've searched in the depths of philosophy and religion. They've searched in the complexity of their own hearts and minds, and even with the curious minds of little children. So how can we, like the young boy, come to know what God is like? How can we come to experience God, experience his presence? Where do we go to understand his character and to learn about his nature? See, the most profound answer to this age-old question was given not in a grand declaration from the heavens, but in a humble manger in Bethlehem. And a truth as beautiful as it is profound, the truth of the incarnation, the incarnation. So this morning, as we turn to the end of John's prologue and the beginning of John chapter one, we find a profound statement in verse 14 that encapsulates this great truth that we call the incarnation. John, with the elegance of a poet and with the precision of a theologian, declares this in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it's here, it's here in the birth of Jesus where we find the key that unlocks our understanding of God. See, the birth of Jesus is so much more than just a historical Occurrence. It's the pivotal point where God's hidden nature becomes accessible, where he's made tangible and knowable to us. See, incarnation is the term that we use that captures the essence of God taking on human flesh and dwelling among us, not just as an unseen spirit, but as a visible, relatable, touchable form. 
The word incarnation is its Latin word, and it literally means to be made flesh. So when we speak of the incarnation, we're speaking of God choosing to inhabit the physical, tangible realm of our existence. We're speaking about God in all of his unfathomable glory, in all of his purity. He chooses to become enfleshed, choosing to literally step into the fabric of our human existence. So when we talk about the incarnation, we're speaking about God bridging that immense gap between the heavenly and the earthly, between the infinite and the finite, between the invisible and the visible. See, in the incarnation, the eternal one entered into time. The infinite one dwelled in the finite, and the holy one inhabited the ordinary. So if that excited little boy got to ask John that same question that he asked his little sister, what does God look like? You know how John would respond? He would say, he looks like Jesus. In other words, if you want to see God, you need only look to Jesus. If you want to see God, you only need to look to Jesus. As we explore John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, we're going to discover through Jesus the face of God. Because if you want to see God, you need only look to Jesus. So our passage this morning is going to uncover for us at least four distinct ways that Jesus uniquely unveils God to us, his character, his nature. And here's the first distinct way. In Jesus, the splendor of God shines brightly among us. In Jesus, the splendor of God shines brightly among us. See, when we talk about splendor or majesty, um, when we're talking about this in reference to God, we're talking about his glory, the glory of God. Right? Imagine what it would be like to witness God's glory. It's maybe a little bit like going out into the country sky, uh, into the countryside on a, uh, where there's zero light pollution and you're standing under there beneath the night sky sky with the stars just gleaming like diamonds scattered across the canvas of space. Each star a testament to the shining, blazing glory of the creator. Yet in Jesus, we see something even more spectacular. In him, the splendor of God shines not just above us in the heavens, but right next to us. He became flesh and dwelt among us. So verse 14 goes on to say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, when we think of God's glory, we tend to uh, imagine something, picture something so immense, uh, so overwhelming that it feels like it's beyond our grasp. And this is understandable because to truly appreciate the glory of God, you need to consider God in the Old Testament, right, where, where the glory of God was perceived as uh, an oftentimes terrifying force. It was a pillar of cloud by day. It was a, a pillar of fire by night that led the Israelites through the wilderness. It was the consuming fire on Mount Sinai when God gave uh, Moses the law. It was the blinding Shekinah glory of God that dwelled in the temple, a glory so intense, so holy, so pure that it was unapproachable for the common person. But at the birth of Jesus, the same glory took on a new, more intimate form. In Christ, the glory of God was revealed to us, not as an overpowering, overwhelming force, but in a form we could understand, a form we could embrace, the form of a fully human man. In Jesus, the glory of God is not a distant, abstract concept. The glory of God is as real and tangible as the hands that healed the sick, the feet that walked those dusty roads in Galilee, the voice that spoke words of life. It's a glory that was wrapped in swaddling clothes, a glory that was held in Mary's arms, a glory that taught in synagogues, a glory that broke bread with sinners and rejects. It was a glory that was seen and heard and felt and touched by thousands of people, including one particular person that John draws attention to here, John the Baptist. Look at verse 15. It says, in the, starting in 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, 
This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. So here, John makes three simple statements that together testify of the glory of Jesus. First, he plainly says that Jesus is he who comes after me. Now here, John is simply acknowledging uh, the order of birth, that Jesus came after him. Jesus was born six months after uh, his cousin John the Baptist was born. And Jesus started his earthly ministry, his public ministry, after his cousin John the Baptist did. So he's just saying he came after me. And then second, John says that despite being younger, Despite being less experienced in earthly ministry, Jesus ranks before him, meaning Jesus surpasses him in every way. Jesus surpasses him in rank. Jesus surpasses him in status, in dignity, in being. And third, John says that the reason Jesus ranks before him is because Jesus was before him. See, and this statement points to the divinity of Jesus, to his pre-existence, to his eternal nature. He recognizes that Jesus uh, is the word from the beginning, the one who existed from the beginning. So John is testifying that Jesus, though he was born later, he's always existed. He spans the gap of eternity. See, John's testimony elevates Jesus to his rightful place as the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He understood that Jesus was the fulfillment of all that the prophets had spoken about, the glory that once dwelled in the tabernacle, the glory that once dwelled in the temple, the glory that inspired awe and reverence among the Israelites. This glory was now present in the person of Jesus. See, John's testimony reminds us that Jesus is not just another teacher. He's not just another rabbi. He's not just another prophet. He's the God of the Old Testament incarnate, embodied in human flesh. So the connection here invites us to rethink how we approach God. Are we still living in the shadow of the old, viewing God as someone distant, someone unapproachable, Or are we embracing the invitation of Christmas to know Jesus intimately? And in knowing Jesus, knowing God. So as we think about this, let's remember that the splendor of Jesus is not a glory that overwhelms us into submission. It's a glory that draws us in to a loving relationship. That's the kind of glory of Jesus. It's a glory that invites us to know God, to love him, to cherish him, to serve him. So will you let the glory of God, the glory that once filled the holy of holies, will you let that glory fill your heart and your life as you follow Jesus? In Jesus, the splendor of God shines brightly among us. Some angels getting their wings. And then we see a second distinct way that Jesus uniquely unveils the character of God to us. Here's the second way. In Jesus, the grace of God flows endlessly toward us. In Jesus, the grace of God flows endlessly toward us. So now as we come to verse 16, we see another facet of God's character, his perfect grace. Look at verse 16. It says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. So reflect for a moment on that phrase, from his fullness. What does it mean that we've received from Jesus his fullness, the fullness of Christ? It means that in Jesus is the sum total of all that is in God. In Jesus is all of God's wisdom, all of God's righteousness, all of God's holiness, all of God's purity, all of his goodness, all of his abundance. It means that Jesus contains the inexhaustible storehouse of God's grace. It means that Jesus contains the overwhelming wellspring of his mercy. It means that Jesus contains the the endless supply of his love that never runs dry. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. See, in Christ, the entirety of God's grace is embodied, ready to be poured out on us. Not as a trickle, not as a mere drop to get us through a, a rough day, 
It's a never-ending river that refreshes us, recharges us, renews us. It's grace upon grace upon grace. I love this imagery of grace stacked atop of grace, layer upon layer upon layer, because it so beautifully illustrates just how deeply God cares for you, just how deeply God cares for me. This is a grace that picks us up when we fall, not just one time, but every single time that we stumble. The gentle, steadfast hands of God lifting us from the depths of our despair, from the depths of our sin, from the depths of our failures. This is a grace that wipes away our tears. When our hearts are heavy and when our spirits are burdened, God's grace comes to us softly, assuring us that we're not alone, assuring us that our pain is seen and felt by him. In those moments of exhaustion, in those moments of near defeat, grace becomes the wind beneath our wings, rekindling our hope, encouraging us, and renewing our spirit. And this is the grace that gives us strength when we're weak. In our weakest moments, when our strength is insufficient, his grace pours into us, transforming our weaknesses into strengths, our fears into courage. This is the grace upon grace that Jesus embodies. To truly understand God's unconditional, unmerited favor, we need only look to Jesus. Look at his life. Look at his teachings and see him touch the untouchables. Watch as he speaks with the outcasts. Watch as he forgives the sinners. Look to Jesus and see a God who's not distant or detached, but one who enters into our world and shares in our struggles and shares in our pains. Many of you are familiar with the name John Newton, a great hymn writer. He's the one who wrote that great hymn and we all cherish, Amazing Grace. But there's a story behind one of the verses in Amazing Grace. See, Newton often collaborated um, with uh, another good friend of his, uh, another hymn writer, a prolific hymn writer uh, by the name of William Cowper. William Cowper was known for writing hymns like um, God Moves in a Mysterious Way and There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. Cowper's life, however, it was a stark contrast to the hope that you see in his hymns. See, he was a man who was tormented by darkness. He battled lifelong depression and severe self-doubt. So John Newton, writing Amazing Grace, he, he, he always wrote his songs for his congregation. And he wrote Amazing Grace and uh, intended to um, introduce it to his congregation uh, for New Year's Day, 1773, January 1st. But it so happens that on that same New Year's Day, Cowper's despair had reached a critical point, plunging him into a state of madness where he almost committed suicide. He was haunted by this false belief that somehow God had abandoned him. So Newton, understanding his friend's depression and despair and turmoil, he composed a particular verse and amazing grace as a message of hope. Because he wanted to convey to his friend that God's grace is boundless. It's a constant, even when we're in the deepest state of despair. And Newton's words became a beacon in the darkness for his friend William. And here's the verse that Newton wrote. A verse that you all probably know. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come was grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. Church, if God is willing to send his son to be born a man, if God's willing to send his son to die a criminal's death for us, do you think he's ever going to deny his grace to us? No. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, his grace is a never-ending, overflowing wellspring. In Jesus, the grace of God flows endlessly toward us. So let this truth fill our hearts with hope and let it fill our lives with purpose as we seek to know God more and as we seek to make him known, especially during this Christmas season. And then we turn to a third distinct way that Jesus uniquely unveils God to us. Here's the third truth. In Jesus, the truth of God is clearly illuminated for us. In Jesus, the truth of God is clearly illuminated for us. See, in a world where the concept of truth 
is increasingly ambiguous, verse 17 echoes with clarity. John 1, 17, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See, the journey to understanding this truth takes us back to that pivotal contrast that John presents. The law given to Moses versus grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. The law given to Moses at Mount Sinai. It was a profound revelation of God's holiness. It revealed his character, his standards, his perfect righteousness. It set forth a standard, a compass for the Israelites, for God's people. Yet, it also highlighted the great chasm between humanity's imperfection and God's ultimate perfection and his perfect standards. But then, at just the right time, Jesus came. In him, the very essence of God's truth has been revealed to us, not as a set of rules, not as a religion, not as a bunch of commandments etched in stone, but as a living, breathing person. Jesus Christ in his words and in his actions and his very being is the embodiment of God's truth. To say that is not a popular thing. This is not popular to say. It's not popular to say Jesus embodies truth. See, we live in a time when truth is seen as subjective and fluid. Hence, those pet peeve phrases that just hurt my head. Your truth, my truth, his truth, her truth. You can't fragment truth like that. That's not how that works. If truth varies from person to person, it's not truth. It's opinion. See, amidst all the conflicting voices and perspectives, the gospel of John directs us to the singular, unchanging truth found in Jesus Christ. As Jesus goes on to say later in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So yes, your experiences of reality and your perceptions of reality might vary, but there exists only one central, unalterable truth, the person of Jesus Christ. Think about his life. Think about his ministry. Every word he spoke, every miracle he performed, every person he touched, that was a revelation of truth. See, as uncomfortable or, or difficult as it might be, especially in the beginning of our, of our walks with Jesus, to accept the exclusive claims of Jesus, you're soon going to find out that his truth, the truth, is a truth that sets you free. It's a truth that restores you. It's a truth that heals you. It's a truth that doesn't just inform you, but transforms you. So as you go about your daily walk, think about how often you find yourself grappling with questions or grappling with doubts or wrestling with uncertainties. Is your knee-jerk reaction to go to Google instead of to God's Word? Have you conditioned yourself to search for truth in religious practices, in self-help books, or in the latest philosophies. See, the invitation of verse 17 beckons you to look to Jesus, for in him the fullness of God's truth has been revealed. In his words, we find wisdom. In his actions, we find guidance. In his life, we find a pattern for our own. In his death, we find forgiveness. And in his resurrection, we find new life. Amen? Amen. In Jesus, the grace of God and the truth of God perfectly collide. It's a truth that acknowledges our failures, but then it offers us redemption. It's a truth that confronts our deepest flaws, but then it provides a path to restoration. It tells us we're more than our mistakes. We're more than our past. We're more than our limitations. That through faith in Jesus Christ, we're beloved children of God, redeemed by grace and called to a higher purpose. In Jesus, the truth of God is clearly illuminated for us. It becomes the guiding light of our lives. Then, as we come to verse 18, we see the fourth distinct way that Jesus uniquely unveils God to us. In Jesus, the essence of God is lovingly unveiled to us. In Jesus, the essence of God is lovingly unveiled to us. Look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So this verse begins with a a stark truth. No one has ever seen God. 
See, in this, throughout the Old Testament, this is echoed repeatedly. God is depicted as the invisible, the unapproachable, the holy one who's shrouded in mystery. From Moses at the burning bush to the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai, the message is clear that God is beyond human sight. No one can see him. He's too pure. He's too holy for human eyes. But yet, in the second part of this verse, there's a dramatic shift. It says, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Meaning the the invisible, incomprehensible God is made known, and he's made known through Jesus Christ. This is not just a theological assertion, church. This is the central narrative of the gospel. What was once hidden about God is brought into light by Jesus. His character, his love, his grace, his truth, his mercy, his very essence has been intimately revealed to us in Christ. Imagine a skilled artist who spends his entire life creating magnificent paintings, but he never shows them to anyone. No one in the world has yet to see them. His art, full of beauty and depth, remains hidden in the studio. Then one day, he decides to reveal his masterpieces in a grand exhibition. The curtains are pulled back, And what was once hidden is now on full display, leaving the entire audience in awe. See, in the same way, God's essence, full of depth and beauty, was fully revealed to us in Jesus. What was once hidden has now been displayed in the person of Christ. Jesus has made known to us the very essence of the Father. So as you read the Gospels, every action of Jesus, every word of his, every interaction, it's a window into the heart of the Father, in his compassion toward the sick, in his tenderness toward the sinner, in his patience with the doubting, and in his love for the outcast, we see the character of God displayed in human form. In Jesus, the essence of God is unveiled to us. And here's the thing, understand that the incarnation is not just a cornerstone of the Christian faith. It is a cornerstone, but it's not just a cornerstone. See, this is a truth that also happens to set Christianity apart from every other world religion and man-made philosophy. See, the concept of the incarnation, of God becoming flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, it's unique to Christianity, and it profoundly impacts how we understand God, how we understand ourselves, and how we understand the relationship between the two. See, in most religions... In most philosophies, whoever their god, gods, or goddesses are, the divine is often understood as a distant, impersonal force or, or energy or set of abstract principles. But then in flies Christianity, which proclaims a god who not only interacts with, but becomes part of humanity. See, in, Je- in Jesus, God experiences human life. He experiences human life with all of its joys, all of its sorrows, all of its limitations, and even all of its temptations. Yet he perfectly withstood every temptation. See, in other religions, people strive to reach up or to reach out to the divine through various means, whether it's through moral living, whether it's through religious ritual, even going to church, that doesn't save you whether it's through enlightenment or meditations or divinations or fortune-telling, you name it. But Christianity is unique in that it presents God reaching down to humanity. In Jesus, God initiates the reconciliation, not because of our merit, but because of his boundless grace and his mercy. This is deeply personal. This is deeply loving. This is deeply relational. And that's what Christianity is. At its core, Christianity is a relationship. It's not about following a certain path. It's not about adhering to a specific set of laws. Christianity offers a relationship. The incarnation means that God's not a distant entity to be appeased. It means that he's not a philosophical concept to be understood, but he's a person to be known and loved and cherished. Because he's the God who demonstrated his radical love for us. We love because he first loved us. See, unlike other worldviews where divine love or favor, where that's entirely abstract, 
if it's even existent. Christianity has something that makes it not abstract at all and very concrete, and that's the cross of Christ. See, there's nothing abstract about the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross stands as the ultimate expression of God's love, a love that chooses to suffer, a love that chooses to die for your sake and for mine. At the cross, God offers us an invitation to a relationship with himself because the cross of Jesus made it known once and for all that God is not some distant, unknowable force. He's a loving father eager to connect with you. Amen? If you want to see God, you need only look to Jesus. In him is the answer to our deepest questions and our greatest longings. Who is God? What is he like? How can we know him? See, these questions found their answer in the manger in Bethlehem. In Jesus, the search for God and the search for understanding him finds its fulfillment. If you want to see God, you need only Look to Jesus. Let's pray. As everyone's in a state of prayer, as we reflect on these profound truths that we've just explored, the uniqueness of Christianity as a relationship with God, the tangible reality of his love displayed on the cross, our hearts are drawn now to a pivotal moment of decision. This isn't just a moment of intellectual assent, but this is a call to a life-changing relationship with the Creator. So for those in this room who have not yet embarked on this journey of faith, I invite you to consider this moment as your personal invitation. God, through Jesus, is reaching out to you, offering a relationship with you based on his love, based on his grace, based on his favor and his truth. So I'll lead us in a prayer now. It's not magic words that bring us into a relationship with God, but it's the sincere desire of our hearts. So if you want to start your journey with God, you can echo these words in your heart or quietly with your lips. Dear God, I recognize my need for you. I believe in what Jesus did on the cross for me. I receive your forgiveness for my sins. I receive your forgiveness for all of my flaws and failures. I accept your invitation to a new life with you. Please come into my heart and begin to lead me from this day.